You are listening to the AOTA podcast. Here is your host, Matt Brandenburg. Okay, today we are joined by Virginia Ginny Stoffel and Lisa Mahaffey, two occupational therapy professionals who are instrumental in the 988 Nationwide Mental Health Crisis and Suicide Prevention Program. Thank you both for being on the show today. Glad to be here. Thank you for having us. It's my pleasure. Um, Before we jump in, I really wanted to highlight um, how you've mentioned to me previously what a large collaboration the development of 988 was and, and still is. Can you briefly describe the background and process of how 988 was created and what your role has been in AOTA 988 initiatives? So this is Ginny, and I think I'll go ahead and um, give kind of an overview because um, I have the just the absolute honor to be contacted by Varlisha Gibbs at AOTA, um, the vice president of uh, the uh, workforce development and uh, practice engagement um, and capacity building uh, segment of the of the AOTA staff. And AOTA had just received an invitation uh, by uh, a number of chief executive officers of major mental health advocacy, direct service, and professional organizations who came together to, to pull uh, the ideas that we'll talk about today, the seven pillars, um, around a unified vision for transforming mental health and substance use in America. And uh, we were, we, we've worked with these organizations on a number of advocacy efforts over the past few decades. And uh, so we were thrilled to be invited, AOTA and its CEO, Sherry Karamidas, as uh, signatories, uh, as people who would sign on to this effort, um, who would uh, take responsibility for communicating with our professional community, and then hopefully uh, the uh, ripples that happen after that, uh, when we pass that on to our co-workers, to those we serve, to the organizations we serve, the communities we live in, uh, to really let people know about a major change that was upcoming. Uh, and I think of this as the first kind of visible change as part of this uh, mental health reform process. And that is what we call this 988 initiative. Uh, and so um, 988 stands for the three numbers that someone would call on their phone, just like 911 when you're in an emergency situation. Um, if you're feeling uh, as if you are in a mental health crisis, uh, have thoughts about suicide, uh, are needing someone to talk to and to seek support from, 988, as of July 16th of 2022, became the new nationwide number. And that replaced a, a, a typical nine-digit number, uh, or is it 10? <laughs> a long number uh, that used to be the crisis and suicide prevention line. Um, 988 uh, has um, been enacted by each and every state. Uh, and so depending on where you live in the country, exactly how the 988 calls uh, happen are, are a little different, but they all have the same intent uh, to provide uh, support, connection, help the person identify their needs and link them to resources uh, to make kind of that warm handoff to um, a program or a person who can uh, assist person who's in a mental health crisis. And um, since we know that we also have critical mental health needs among our veteran community, there is also uh, a link to uh, veteran-specific experts who, um, once you call 988, uh, you're given the option to uh, dial another digit. And for veterans, that's one and then you can be connected um, there. So AOTA uh, felt that this was a really important way to uh, activate our community to you know, really tap into this new um, 
focus on uh, on reaching people when they are in crisis so as to uh, provide the supports needed. I love that. And it, it really is such a, a large um, initiative, a nationwide initiative that took so many different groups and, and efforts to to carry out. Um, I know I've seen uh, information about 988 in the news since it was released last July. Um, why, why would you say this resource is so important for occupational therapy professionals to be familiar with? Yeah, I mean, I can, um, I can jump in. I, I came on to the, this committee, uh, a little bit later. <laughs> um, I think the first iteration of the, of the seven pillars had been done. And uh, I was asked along with another person, uh, that I was working with to just kind of take a look at these. And, you know, one of our thoughts was that, um, the the form really laid out so some of the really good information about 988, uh, but didn't really sort of address maybe where occupation sort of fell into to that. And I think um, I think that's a piece that um, that we really want to get out there, right? Where where in this crisis sort of management 988 the crisis management uh, approach, and and how can we as a profession who has a background in mental health who really started as mental health providers, which I would argue many people don't know, how we can sort of support people's journey in, in their recovery process, how we can support people through crisis, uh, and how we can maybe help people develop lifestyles and routines that uh, that accommodate their mental health disabilities uh, and, and allow them to move forward in their lives and maybe even avoid future crisis. So I think I think that's important. I think we, we work in, in every single space in the healthcare and education and even in community-based programs. Uh, and that means we have eyes and ears on the ground uh, in, in a lot of different places. So having this really uh, this basic knowledge of uh, how can you uh, approach somebody and, uh, and and where do you go? What who can you call and where do you go? Is something that I think we, as again trained mental health providers, uh, can really offer in even non mental health spaces, you know, schools, um, colleges, uh, churches, uh, other communities uh, where occupational therapists are involved in, in programming or even just in daily life. So I think that those are two big reasons why there's so much value in us uh, having this knowledge uh, and information. I, I love that answer, Lisa. Were you going to go ahead and chime in, Ginny? Well, I was I was going to just say, Lisa reminded me that uh, that I didn't actually talk about uh, how it was then we started inviting more people to be involved, uh, because what we recognize is that this message that Lisa just gave, uh, that we are trained mental health professionals, um, and we work uh, not necessarily just in mental health organizations. In fact, many of us uh, work in places where we know people connect with us. Uh, they, uh, they seek to find healthy ways to live. Uh, they, they want to actively deal with the everyday life stressors that are part of their um, life experience so that they can be well and flourish and overcome whatever um, challenges that they're coming to see us for. And so um, quickly, um, both uh, a team of AOTA staff uh, uh, I mentioned Varlisha, uh, Scott Trudeau, um, Aileen Schuld Harris, a number of um, support staff, Angela Warren. And so these folks have been able to uh, set up a series of meetings that we've held over the last year and a half, starting in fall of 2021, so before um, 988 was to even uh, be un unfolded. Uh, but also, um, we reached out to a number of educators, practitioners, mental health advocates. Uh, Lisa, I think you were on the AOTA Board of Directors at that time, and, and we thought it was really important to tap into uh, our board members who are very knowledgeable and experienced in this part of practice. And so this is one of those efforts that my hope is, over time, uh, you, you might just you know do that 
roaming interview, let's say, at, um, at a AOT or an occupational therapy gathering and ask people about 988 and how it is that they use their knowledge uh, to uh, help people who, who are uh, trying to, as, as Lisa mentioned, avoid crises, um, live a life uh, that provides them the, uh, the supports that they need to uh, to really fully participate in everyday life. So uh, so we've reached out to state associations, uh, state association presidents, um, member active members of the mental health special interest section, uh, to um, program directors, educators, fieldwork educators, to students. Uh, so we believe that uh, that the more people that we can uh, get involved and becoming more knowledgeable about uh, what's happening in our communities, uh, the needs that have been unmet um, under uh, our previous uh, mental health and substance abuse intervention structures, um, and, um, and to really look very broadly at uh, how is it that uh, we can be sure that every occupational therapy practitioner, every occupational therapist, every OT assistant, every occupational therapy student uh, recognizes that, uh, that these are uh, skills that we all collectively bring to uh, the work that we do as occup in occupational therapy. And, and so um, one of the articles that um, Berlicia and I wrote for the Occupational Therapy and Mental Health Journal pulls uh, from uh, some of the comments that we have on the AOTA website, um, which is that um, in support of the unified visionary signatory, the AOTA encourages occupational therapy practitioners to use their skills, training, and expertise to address mental health in our community, every person, every age, every condition. Um, so to really take that, that uh, very uh, strong, clear, broad brush approach to, to claim um, these are skills that enhance the work that we do and the outcomes that we know people are seeking. And that really is such an important message, I think, as a whole in our society and our nation. Um, a lot has been done to kind of highlight the need to improve the access to mental health services. Um, a lot's been done to uh, kind of get rid of the, the stigma that used to surround um mental health resources and, and practice. Um, and like you mentioned, Lisa, OT is really uniquely positioned to identify how mental health struggles really impact occupational performance. Um, what, what would you say can be done to really increase occupational therapy's role in, in providing mental health services and achieving this goal that, that you mentioned, Ginny? Well, again, that one I think either of us can comment on. Lisa, why don't you go first? I, th I think I think a lot of it has to do w with us kind of putting ourselves out there. I um, and 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 really working to think about how do we approach introducing organizations to what we can bring to their already usually good services, right? So, um, for example, a couple of years ago, some of us in the state of Illinois were interested in. Uh, trying to increase our presence within community-based mental health organizations because we knew that in this state, people were getting moved out of institutions and into their own apartments and that uh, the organizations that were doing this were struggling. So, uh, and not, not with everybody, but there, were there was definitely a percentage of people who were not doing well in this transition. So it was our belief that we could serve that particular group. So we got together, we developed a referral process that really kind of laid out exactly what we could bring to the table. We were very cognizant of making sure that that was not the same as the rest of the team. And that's something I think that's really important. So what is our unique and very distinct value? What do we actually bring to the table that supports the, the really incredible teams that are out doing community-based mental health? Um, but what, where, where can we come in and serve where they're struggling? And, uh, and very often that was... Uh, we specifically focused on the folks that were not doing as well with typical services. And, um, and they really just created a very clear way for them to understand 
what we could do to support them. And I think that's something that uh, that we struggled with a little bit as a profession, is really sort of highlighting that distinct piece. So specifically, you know, working with people, I just, I just had a student actually reach out to me uh, about someone she's working with that's homeless, that is having trouble doing some hygiene things. And we just went through a whole process about, you know, instead of just teaching someone to do hygiene, which they probably know, let's step back and really talk about, do they have the motivation for that? You know, do they really want to do that? Well, what, what's getting in their way? What are the exact barriers? And, um, and really taking breaking that task down into some small little pieces so that people can get little bits of success um, as they move through this process. You know, pretty sure this gentleman hadn't been doing much hygiene for a while. So again, getting into the habits and, uh, and making a routine out of it and finding a routine that works. So I think those kinds of being able to articulate really specific things that address areas that, that the teams are struggling with is, is one way that we can develop uh, an understanding of why we might bring some value to those teams. This, by the way, has worked, this process. And, and we've every time we've had someone come into a community mental health position, we've pulled them in. We've gone through the process of teaching um, the ref how we've structured the referral, uh, and we've now we've moved from one to two community-based mental health OTs to almost 40 in the last five years. So the state of Illinois has almost 40 occupational therapists, occupational therapy practitioners within community-based mental health programs as a result of this sort of combined support and our ability to articulate what we bring that was distinct. Um, I think that's. That's a start. Um, it's in some ways, I think we just have to really also spend some time thinking about what is that distinct value, um, because you know so many of these community teams help people grocery shop. They they help them manage their apartment. They help them clean it. They they don't necessarily help them get into routines. They don't necessarily look at how to break tasks down into little pieces so that you can look at the barriers. But they do a really good job with some of the things that we've sometimes claimed as our own. So, again, really sort of understanding who we're working with and then um, uh, and then the, the sort of really wonderful skills and, uh, and abilities and knowledge uh, of occupation that we bring to that table and making sure that we can articulate that in a way that doesn't uh, – sound like we think we do things better than others, which I also, which in my experience has happened in the past, uh, where occupational therapists have come in and done counseling kinds of things, uh, and the counselors felt like um, they were being um, told that we could do it better. So, so again, just uh, really understanding what is that distinct value, and then having a really uh, a, a way to articulate it being able to articulate in a way where these organizations understand and, uh, and and see the value of us at the table. I think the other thing that's really working now is uh, we're putting students here in Illinois into uh, in doctoral programs into uh, some of these organizations that don't have uh, occupational therapy services in them, and, uh, and that's been a real boon. So again, really working with the organization to identify some of the challenges they're facing, and then uh, working with the students to develop capstone projects that specifically address some of those challenges, and that's, I think, getting a foot in the door to some of these places. I think I've had four capstone projects now in the last two years that uh, they've reached out and wanted to hire OTs. Uh, including our foster care program here in the state. Wow. It, it sounds like the work you've been a part of in Illinois it has grown so much and just really illustrates how OT can can meet this uh, rising need and provide an example for, you know, other states and organizations that, that want to achieve the same. I, I think another place where there's been a huge success and really is um, um, helping lead the way uh, beyond the state of Ohio, but uh, Dr. Susan Basic uh, was asked, I think it's been almost 10 years uh, since the education folks at their state level reached out to her to uh, provide uh, leadership and um, actually change agency to the OT practitioners who worked in the school systems. Um, what they were finding is that many of the students were coping with mental health issues, trauma, 
that they brought to school with them and were um, you know, really struggling with their learning processes, much less the mental health. Sometimes when we use the term mental health, people think mental illness, uh, but to really think about that full continuum uh, towards uh, mental health and, and uh, flourishing and thriving um, you know, across that continuum. Uh, and so to really look at how is it that we can take our knowledge of people, their occupations, and the environments that those take place in, which includes the other personnel in that environment. And, and so rather than to come in and, um, as Lisa said, you know, kind of claim, we know how to do it better. Um, we want to do this with you. We want to be part of your collaborative efforts. We do think we can bring some distinct value because of our deep knowledge of that person, environment, and occupation um, link uh, that sometimes is what um, might be considered kind of the hidden challenges or the hidden barriers to full participation. Uh, and our knowledge of, of uh, group dynamics and, um, and intentionality and, and motivation and volition um, are really great tools that not only occupational therapy has, but, but so do other people in, in the um, schools, as well as the professional environments and community environments that we carry out our work. So, um, so for a long time, um, and, and now I'm talking 45 years ago when I was first hired as a pilot project in a substance abuse setting, uh, we had the same 45 years ago growth where I was a pilot project and within three years, there were 18 of us uh, providing a full array of services, inpatient, outpatient, uh, in a long-term care facility for people who were struggling because of, of other health and complex uh, kinds of, of conditions. And so people appreciate that we are really able to kind of activate people uh, to fully engage in those occupations that they both they need to and that they want to uh, by addressing sometimes what for others might be um, simply a lack of awareness. Yeah, I was listening, Lisa, to you talk about the, uh, the man um, uh, where the student was addressing hygiene issues. And, and for so many people, homeless um, and otherwise, uh, where can you do that? And where can you do that in a safe and respectful kind of space? And, um, and so really helping our students recognize the unmet needs, uh, especially when you think about what we think of as simple activities of daily living and instrumental activities of daily living, um, health maintenance occupations that really need more creative ways to address and interprofessional teams, uh, working with peer support specialists, um, those, those all become the people that we want to collaborate with. I love that. Thank you so much. Um, you've both laid out such a wonderful blueprint of uh, collaboration and how to approach collaboration as an, an occupational therapy professional. Um, I, I want to discuss the the seven pillars of 988 that uh, you mentioned earlier. Um, so there are seven critical pillars of 988. What what are each of these pillars and how can OT practitioners really get involved um, with each one of them? So like I said, the pillars were uh, were uh, first articulated by this uh, these lead 14 lead uh, organizations. Uh, and so we came uh, to uh, see the materials they develop and then um, have developed some tools uh, available through the AHA website. One is titled the 988 Critical Pillars and OT Connection. Um, and so, so what I'll do is I'll, I'll talk, uh, I'll just give you the titles of those pillars so you get this how, how comprehensive this transformation process is. And then we can, Lisa and I can uh, comment on some particular aspects of the pillars. Um, but pillar one, it has to do with early identification and prevention efforts. Pillar two has to do with then emergency and crisis response. And of course, that's where, that's where 988 fits in. Equity and inclusion is pillar three being sure that the uh, programs that are available um, are available to all and are of the same high quality for all. 
The fourth pillar is about integration and partnership. And here is where our stories about collaboration and partnering with different kinds of organizations plays a critical role. Um, pillar uh, five has to do with fair and equitable coverage. So making sure that there's parity um, about the coverage that um, is available to all citizens. Uh, pillar six has to do with the standards of care. And again, uh, bringing and articulating that OT value uh, that is as uh, impacts the standards. And then uh, pillar seven has to do with workforce capacity. We hear so much about how unprepared different uh, programs and systems are for the level of mental health and substance abuse, um, the level of suicide um, interventions needed. Just since 988 has rolled itself out, um, there's, there's an increase in more than half a million uh, people connecting with the program. And, and that's in less than, you know, we've, we're only this many months into it. So um, we've seen um, just the release of the um, substance abuse use information from the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration. We're seeing huge increases in um, people um, who are, um, you know, really taking part in, in everyday occupations uh, that are risky including alcohol, drug use, um, opioid use, and, and so on. So these seven pillars are um, unfolding today. And as we continue to, uh, to work uh, and collaborate with others, I think we're going to be working on these kinds of things for the next 20 years. It's not going to change overnight. So early identification and prevention. Lisa, you want to talk about programs that you've been involved with? So uh, my, my other role beside occupational therapy is uh, I'm a trained mental health first aid instructor. And, um, and I've been really, really fortunate to be able to start to, to have trained occupational therapy students all over the country and occupational therapy practitioners, actually, at least in, in the, in, uh, around in the Midwest. And I think, um, again, I go back to uh, how much uh, crisis and, or, or even just uh, activities prior to crisis can be uh, clearly observed through people's participation and occupation, you know, um, dropping off, uh, withdrawing, um, so many of the signs and symptoms that we see that uh, are leading to a crisis uh, manifest themselves through participation and occupation and, and um, participating and doing things with others. Uh, so one of the, the things I really like about the mental health first aid training, which is not occupational therapy, but actually I kind of, I, I sort of throw my special sauce into is that the, the respect we do teach about what, how to identify a person who might be in crisis or really struggling with a mental health uh, challenge and we and it's really concrete uh, you know look for these things these are these are early signs these are middle signs these are risk factors and and again because occupational therapy works in rehabilitation settings where people are struggling with a major change in their capacity and in, in their experience of their daily lives where schools and transitional spaces from foster care or in and out of jail, or there are more and more OTs working in these kinds of settings where people are really struggling with challenges. Um, having those those early skills combined with our, uh, our our knowledge of occupation and our knowledge of um, participation and uh, habit and, and uh, routine, etc., volition, motivation. I think uh, that really puts us in a position as a profession to be a a really active part of that early identification and prevention. Even after after the crisis, I'm not sure that we have as much of a role in crisis other than um, having the knowledge to move people into uh, spaces where they can be safe. But we certainly have a lot of input into the other pillars, equity and inclusion, um, integration and partnership, uh, and, and some of the others. So. Um, that's where I think, as far as early identification and prevention goes, I think we have that, that view and that, uh, and as long as we have the knowledge of where to go and who to call and um, 
how to help people move into those spaces. Uh, again, I think we we're in, we're in a good position to do that. And that's such an excellent example, Lisa, of how this is a continuum. Um, and 988 is a step in that continuum, but it's important for people to realize that there's more to it. Um, and I love how you illustrated how an occupational therapy practitioner um, in this case, yourself can use your knowledge and your skills and your expertise um, to work across that continuum and identify and, and prevent um, some of those uh, mental health difficulties that someone may be experiencing or going through. Um, what about some of the additional pillars? How would you recommend OT practitioners get involved um, and, and continue to, to work across this continuum? So when we look at the equity and inclusion um, pillar, uh, many practitioners uh, are working in underserved communities and, um, and really look at the, uh, the social determinants of health that impact their ability to engage um, in everyday life. Um, and so um, being able to um, use our role as citizens, informed professionals and citizens who can help shape uh, the kinds of uh, programs and the quality of programs uh, so that all people have access to uh, the, um, the services that they need. Uh, making sure as researchers, so I have to, you know, I have to wear that research hat myself to say, uh, have I included everyone's voices or are we only studying a certain portion of our, of our population? Uh, so being sure that there's uh, best practices that uh, provide culturally, linguistically appropriate um, uh, tools to, uh, to carry out our work and, um, and to always um, have uh, the persons that, that we serve be the drivers of that process uh, and, um, and to learn with them and from them as to what it is that matters most to them. What are the occupations that, uh, that they need to and want to um, engage in? Um, and so it may be you know, learning about very different ways of life than practitioners themselves um, know. Uh, and yeah, uh, I'm, I'm always um, impressed. Uh, we just had a mental health conference, specialty conference in Columbus, Ohio, just last month in December of 2022. And, um, and there were, there were how many of us, Lisa? 400? Yeah, I think so. 300. Uh, and, um, and people um, sharing their um, programs and services. Um, making sure that we have a diverse workforce uh, that can meet the needs of our diverse communities. Um, those are those are long range issues that we've worked on, but we absolutely have to continue. I think in that space too, I, you know, part of what we have to do as a profession is recognize that, that our profession is dependent on people with disability, and uh, uh, again, in equity and inclusion, recognizing that disability itself is a minority group uh, and one that is been typically oppressed. And um, so also just looking at our role of uh, recognizing kind of the position, the positionality of people with disabilities and uh, and taking on a, that additional piece of advocacy. And uh, it's, it's hard to be someone with a disability, I think, in a society that's really focused on oh, competition and normality and um, always achieving. And, and there are lots of people with disabilities who uh, don't necessarily want to overcome their disability. They, they want to just to have a life and, and be recognized as a valued part of society. Uh, regardless or, or because of their disability. So I think we have a, a big role in that as well um, in advocating and advocating and really recognizing the barriers to inclusion for this group of people that, that you know, are the reason we exist as a profession. Uh, and, and that's a mental health issue. I think, uh, there's, you know, just reading, there's a pretty high percentage of people with autism who... Uh, die by suicide every year and uh and and very often because they don't feel like they have equitable 
access or uh, acceptance and inclusion. So again, you know, just going back to the really, uh, really recognizing, you know, who are the groups that are not included, and uh, and and as experts in occupation, uh, where those barriers are, and as, along with supporting that person to develop their skills, also looking at policies and situations in the community and uh, and, and creating spaces where people feel comfortable and, uh, and willing to participate. A great example of a graduate who is currently developing a daycare for kids with disabilities because of our discussions on the fact that that was something that wasn't available to people. You know, so often when kids have a disability, they're kept out of daycare. Uh, so her goal is to create uh, an equitable, uh, inclusive daycare program for children with pretty significant disabilities. Uh, and that's something I think as occupational therapists, we really can, therapy practitioners, we really can uh, be a, a, a significant, can contribute significantly uh, to that effort. Absolutely. Excuse me, that's a, another wonderful example. Um, and again, I just want to remind listeners, they can look for that document on AOTA.org, um, connecting occupational therapy and, and 988. Um, I wanted to ask now a little bit more of the specifics of, of 988. Can you describe what would happen when someone calls or, or texts that three-digit code? So I think I mentioned before that um, the, uh, the downside, it could be the upside, it depends on where you live. Uh, that each um, each state has a trained uh, workforce to um, to respond to and answer those either calls or texts, um, and um, um, they typically will um, you know ask open questions to get a sense for what the person um, is experiencing, what what um, what kinds of challenges uh, they might be in. Um, of course, safety. Um, is always um, a piece, and um, and then uh, really looking for um, those needs uh, and and um, helping them connect with um, a program or a um, person in that person's life um, who they can um, also reach out to. Um, Lisa, did I remember that maybe you had uh, someone you were helping through this process recently? Well, I you know I do want to. I did actually, but I, w- I want to go back real quick. I do think that there's, uh, I'm involved in, in some rather interesting groups and there will, really was some misinformation about 988. Uh, there was a group of people who were putting out information that 988 was tied into 911. And I just want to clarify that it really isn't. Um, the 988, it, obviously it's different in every state, but in, in most states it's, it's connected to what used to be the suicide hotlines. So every state had numbers that were suicide hotline numbers. These were complicated numbers, and they were different in every state. Um, and, and sometimes there were multiple numbers uh, in states. In fact, I know there were multiple numbers here in Illinois. Um, and the 988 number goes into that system. So sometimes that's private organizations. Sometimes that's a, a statewide authority that's running that. Um, I did see a, a, some pushback on that misinformation. And one of the things it said is that about three to 4% of 988 calls do go to 911. And that's because they couldn't find another solution. Um, They couldn't get that person maybe to a a space that was safe, or they just weren't getting a response and they felt like they needed to have someone go to that, to the, um, to that residence or that that uh, place of business or whatever whatever it might be that the person was calling from, so there are th- that is that is the final or the last option when people are concerned about that person's safety and they aren't finding another solution. Um, I did actually uh, have a situation where I where I had a student who was struggling, and, and actually the situation was I chose to accompany her. She actually asked me if I would accompany her. Uh, to for an emergency assessment, but the interesting part of it was that the person that was assessing us was unfamiliar with 988, um, and that was a little concerning. They gave her some other numbers, and uh, so we we literally left and had a conversation. She was uh, she actually was allowed to go home, and they um, set up some follow up care for her that was appropriate, but. Uh, 
we did have a conversation about um, 988 in the state of Illinois, which is which is really well organized here for sure. Yeah, you know, I think the um, the the piece of 988 that um, is being monitored really carefully has to do with both what are the numbers of people who are reaching out using 988. Um, but also, how long are they waiting? So um, NPR, um, if you go to their website, I went there early this morning just to see if it was still up. Um, I heard it last week. Um, and um, they were talking about this increase of half a million callers over, what, um, 2021 in the same time period. And that uh, a year ago, people were were, um, were on the line for more than three minutes before they actually heard a real human and interacted with the real person. Uh, with the increased funds and training and uh, workforce development to, to man these lines, uh, the, um, the, the wait time was down to uh, an average of 34 seconds. Uh, so to go from three minutes to 34 seconds is certainly, um, given the volume increase, um, is certainly you know the kinds of numbers that you would you would hope for. But in a in a system this large, there's going to be a lot that needs to be worked on. Um, I checked the VA 988 site um, just in the last few days to see what they were reporting. Um, again, they were reporting the same, you know, very significant increase in numbers, uh, how the calls were handled, how long do people engage on the line, what issues did they discuss. Uh, so they were starting to do a deeper analysis. Um, on the other hand, you know, and I think, Lisa, you mentioned this before, uh, given the open social media communication, uh, if you look in the comments section on this VA um, site that's reporting uh, about the program, um, there's you know uh, open um, access for anyone to add their comments, and um, and so there were certainly some comments that reflected positive, but there were quite a number that also reflected negatively, where people felt like 988 was um, simply another layer that was going to bring the police to their door, and it, the kind of ne negative interactions that we um, sometimes um, hear about. Um, when that doesn't work. Uh, so, you know, so I think this is, you know, one of those um, programs where we do have to be sure that we correct misinformation, uh, that we, you know, um, but that we pay really close attention to how are, how are the calls being handled and are people connecting and getting the access that they need. You know, we know that access is a huge uh, part of, um, making that first step to connect with the programs and services that might make a big difference in people's lives. Um, so helping to facilitate that process uh, is absolutely critical. And, and 988 is one piece of it. But, but again, I think for those of us who've worked in community mental health programs across time, you know, often we are a significant person in that person's life, um, as are their colleagues and peers in um, their recovery programs. So uh, to really think about not just partnering with other professionals, but partnering with families, partnering with uh, people who have their own lived experience of their own recovery, um, and, and being sure that um, the, the connections um, are there, um, that we can facilitate those connections. And it sounds like so many improvements have already been made to 988 since it was was rolled out. Um, and Lisa, you shared that percentage earlier of how three to four percent of of calls um, do go to 911. Um, and I just wanted to ask, what what would you say to those people, um, Ginny and Lisa, who who are concerned that contacting 988 might lead to police involvement or involuntary treatment at emergency rooms or, or psychiatric hospitals what what message would you would you yeah i mean i think uh, i think 988 is fantastic uh i think that's the re i mean it's easy to remember it's accessible for people i don't i, I think with jenny i agree with jenny in that um it doesn't necessarily solve the challenges within the mental health system itself and i think Honestly, that was a lot of the negative comments that I saw. It wasn't so much about 988. It was really about, you know, when I saw it help in the past, these things happened to me. And there, there are some real challenges. Uh, 
I don't know. You know, I, I think I think my response to someone is that yes, three percent of those calls do go to nine one one, but I think it's a huge improvement that uh ninety seven percent of them don't <laughs> and that ninety seven percent of them go to trained people who um oh I mean Hopefully, in, in most states, that 97% of those calls are going to people who've been trained to support somebody through that process. There are so many options. Uh, in the state of Illinois, again, we have, and this is what I'm most familiar with, but we have something called a warm line, which is just an opportunity for people to talk to a peer provider. And and those some of those calls are being uh, uh, sent to the warm lines so that people just have opportunity to talk because sometimes that's all that people need. Uh, so, so my response would be that there's a lot of options out there. You know, we have something here called the living room, which is a, a space where people can go for 48 hours uh, that isn't an emergency room where you are supported. Uh, so 988 is um, also sending people to those spaces. Uh, and, and oftentimes, again, just spending 12 hours sitting in a safe space with somebody listening uh, these are also manned by peer providers in the state, Well, is enough for someone to be able to get back into their routines and their process and to move forward. Um, and I, I, again, I think as occupational therapy practitioners, we have a, a, an opportunity or, or even a responsibility to support that process by making sure that, that our students and our practitioners know what are the resources in our states. And, uh, and you know, again, how do we not just support 988, but also uh, provide that information because it's just not available. Um, that was one of the things about mental health first aid that I've experienced is I, I go out and I teach these things and people have never heard of this before. They've not been taught this. We don't talk about mental health issues in schools. We don't talk about schizophrenia when we talk about, you know, depression or uh, when we talk about uh diabetes, for, let's say, in, in schools. People aren't given this information, and, um, and when they're in crisis, they can't find it. So 988, for that sense, is, is great. I still think there's a lot that has to happen within the mental health system itself. Um, but, um, but I think this is a good stop, and, you know, sometimes necessity is the mother of invention, I think. <laughs> That's a great point. That's a great point. And I, I love your recommendation for practitioners to, you know, learn more about resources that are available in their communities. What what action steps would you recommend to practitioners who are interested to begin their own involvement uh, with 988 or with um, some more community mental health resources? So, so while we were at AOTA in San Antonio, uh, I had just come from a session where we had met with state association presidents about 988, and um, and I interacted with an occupational therapist um, in the hallway who I'd never met before, and um, he was from, um, gosh, Kentucky maybe. He um, was asking me about. Uh, 988 and uh, mental health programs uh, across the country. And I, I, you know, I said to him, I said, you know, if you would like to join our 988 work group, you're more than welcome. I said, but truthfully, go ahead and just uh, see who's running the program in your state. Uh, do they have a place or a need for uh, volunteers? Uh, you know, uh, learn more about, you know, it, work with somebody um, who uh, might need that and, and be alongside of them, you know, to see what actually happens, um, you know, reach out to the, the centers. Really within a few days, he did more legwork than many other people have done um, who, you know, is, are, are um, just aware of the 988 efforts. So I would definitely look to, look to your own um, state and um, ask questions. Um, notice when um, that we had we had a great article on the growing mental health needs of children, and Children's Wisconsin, uh, our hospital, uh, has totally expanded their OT services and um, their mental health services. Um, and so, just just in the last um, two weeks, uh, 
uh, the practitioner who was hired to uh, help expand those services um, gave me a call and said, you know, I've never met you, but I, you know, uh, use your book throughout my OT training. And um, I know you live nearby. You know, would you be interested in hearing more about what we're doing for children and for families um, as they deal with mental health issues? Uh, so, um, so really kind of keep your eyes and ears open. Um, you know, encourage, uh, there's a lot of, of uh, working on uh, connecting people when they are in crisis um, through churches and other um, kind of more um, spiritually focused groups. Um, you know, see what they're doing. Uh, you know, encourage people who have an inkling towards those kinds of, of um, potential resources. Uh, yeah, I can tell you, uh, I'm, I'm, an, I'm a new retiree, so I have a little bit more time to spend time in my community. And, um, and yeah, even just being in my neighborhood and the number of, of um, even though I just retired and so my kids are like, Mom, you're old, um, I'm a lot younger than the people who live around me and um, often can help them connect with uh, the kind of um, feeling like they belong, feeling like there are people that care for them, uh, just you know, promoting connections among neighbors. Uh, to um, you know, break down the isolation. Um, we're not so isolated this year because we don't have like 10, 10 tons of snow in, in Wisconsin anyway. Um, I know the weather has been weird all over the country, uh, but that plays a factor in, in you know, people leaving their homes to connect with others and it impacts their mental health. So you know, kind of recognizing that the opportunities are everywhere, they're endless. I would just add too that the mental health first aid courses. I uh, I was honestly skeptical <laughs> when I started this. I actually took the training course because my university was having some challenges, and they wanted somebody to be a trainer to train the faculty and staff. Uh, so I went into it with some skepticism and came out a real believer. I think uh, I think because the mental health first aid program is specifically focused on what do you do in crisis? Well, it's not even crisis. It's what do you do when you know somebody? How do you help someone get, move into the system? I think it just really complements what we teach in the program in general. In the program, we teach how do you, as an occupational therapist, work with someone who's experiencing a mental health challenge. Well, this is really focused on crisis. It's for anybody um, and everyone, but I think uh, it's been fun for me to, and, and there's a group of us, by the way, of uh, occupational therapy practitioners who are certified trainers now, um, and a growing group, actually. I think it's been really fun to take my mental health experience and my knowledge and actually train OT students and practitioners in what to look for and then what the steps are in order to respond. It's very specific. It's very application-based. Uh, and part of it is that we are expected as trainers to provide a really nice comprehensive list of you know, what are the resources in the community around where that uh, training is taking place. So in about two weeks, I'm doing a training for our disability uh, studies faculty and staff down at the University of Illinois, Chicago. And I had my work-study student pull together a really comprehensive resource list uh, for that area around the university and just a little bit beyond. Uh, and so they will leave that training not just with a set of steps or what to do when you see something what to look for, what to do when you see someone struggling. Literally, we teach what words to say and how to say them. Um, they'll have a really nice comprehensive list of what's available uh, and where you can take, what, what are the options? Uh, aside from 988, could you uh, take someone somewhere? Uh, and where are those spaces? Where are they located? What are the phone numbers? So I really do recommend there's, um, I, I also do, I'm also a certified trainer for youth mental health first aid, which is very specific to uh, teenagers in um, school settings. Uh, and, I, and I think the complementary piece of that, again, given the fact that we're in all of these spaces, schools, communities, colleges, and universities, uh, you know, churches, neighborhoods, <laughs> you name it, um, the combination of our knowledge of mental health and uh, and having some knowledge of how to respond to what the resources are. I think we can, again, be a really strong force for change, both in the system uh, and uh, in addressing mental health issues that are out there. 
Absolutely. And that's, that's such an encouraging message. Um, I love the emphasis on the importance of collaboration and on community. And even if you're an occupational therapy practitioner, not um, practicing in a mental health setting, uh, you know, you can, you can look up 988 in your state. You can strive to be more involved in your community to search out some of these resources that are available. You can find one of these wonderful courses um, that, that Lisa teaches uh, to, to really learn more about this topic. Um, where would you say listeners can find more information related to 988 and how to get involved in their local and state mental health communities? Well, of course, the web is um, um, has great search engines, and and truly, the nine um, just simply putting nine eight eight in your um, search uh, line um, will yield you quite a number of resources. Because you want to look for uh, government sites, uh, the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration, uh, organizations like the National Alliance on Mental Illness. Uh, those are uh, sometimes good, you know, I think, go-to sites uh, for information. Um, Lisa, what are your thoughts? You know, I think um, every state has a, a state authority. Um, some are better than others, uh, but those can be a wealth of information. Uh, even just calling uh, the community mental, the community, uh, I'm sorry, the county uh, your county, uh, oftentimes our counties are responsible for uh, providing services, mental health services uh, to, the, to the people who live in that county, uh, and they offer different services. Um, I, that was a wealth of information for me when I, when I started working in a particular place. I would always call the county mental health authority uh, and just learn what their services were, what was available, you know, where I could um, send people, um, even just uh, looking up you know, what are the hospitals and what kinds of services do they provide in the area? I look for, uh, one of the things that, that I've been taught to look for in different states, and, and when I do these, these trainings out of state, I always look at our states struggling with a particular issue. Uh, and for example, here in the state of Illinois, we do institutionalize people with mental health issues, and we've gotten in trouble for that. So um, it's, that's good to know um, for me because uh, as a provider, again, and, and as uh, someone interested in supporting mental health, I can take a role in um, supporting that effort uh, by the state to uh, better support people in the community, right? So, so looking up what's available, what's happening, uh, what's the state's response to those, those kinds of situations um, uh, also gives me a lot of information about how I can get involved. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing um, your expertise and your knowledge on, on related to these topics. Um, before we conclude our, our interview, I wanted to ask if uh, there's anything else related to 988 or the topics that we've discussed that you'd like to, to revisit or add to, or if we're, we're ready for our concluding segment. Well, um, I'll just say that um, that one of the ways that I try to approach the work that I've done across my career has been to be sure that I keep myself in the best possible health and well-being. Uh, so paying attention to um, what's happening to me and my responses. Um, being a mental health practitioner can be traumatizing. Uh, so really taking what we know about trauma-informed care and uh, being sure that you give yourself time and space and grace and engage. You know, for example, even just to have my head clear for today's podcast, I went and did laps um, the hour before um, we came on. Uh, so doing whatever those occupations are that uh, keep you at your best, uh, but also making sure that you contribute to that collective well-being. So um, paying attention to the people around you that you work with, yeah, as a faculty member, I did this both with my peers as well as our students uh, to, uh, you know, take time, you know, in a three hour class to make sure that there's um, movement breaks, um, cognitive breaks, you know, structural walk and talk, um, you know, pay attention to people's well-being, uh, give them time to reflect. Um, and and give them feedback and support. You know, show care and compassion. Uh, you know, I think um, schools and workplaces uh, are 
places where people are engaged in their everyday occupations and they're but they're also places where we can develop that culture of caring and culture of compassion um, so uh, you know do whatever you can to create that culture wherever you are that's a great point, Jenny. Compassion fatigue is real, and you know we can't establish a culture like that um, without taking care of ourselves. Uh, so that's a great piece of advice, which leads us now to our, our concluding segment, my <clears throat> personal favorite part of the show. Uh, sorry, I'm losing my voice over here. Um, but if you could give one piece of advice to OT professionals, what would you say? I would say... Uh, Really be in touch with who you are, uh, what motivated you to be in the position that you're in, how can you use your knowledge of person, environment, and occupation to create the change that will allow others to not need our services. <laughs> Uh, to fully engage in the things in the things that matter most to them, that bring them the greatest uh, growth. Um, and growth isn't always comfortable, so I'm not you know just talking about happiness, uh, but rather that you feel like you lived a what life worth living. Um, I, I truly believe that uh, that's at the core of the power of occupation, and um, and so we're just here to guide people along that path? I think mine would be to find uh, a like-minded group of professionals within your um, state or your area where you work. Uh, and, and actually, I guess we could call it a community of practice of sorts. Really use that, you know, even if it's just like once a month or once every couple of months, just sort of pulling together, um, talking about what's happening within the state, uh, thinking about what are the barriers to providing services, whether that's, uh, you know, oftentimes we have one practitioner in a full, in, a, in an organization and they sort of feel like they're you know, swimming upstream. Uh, so what can we do to sort of support that person? Um, and just, just having the opportunity for me, that was really a powerful opportunity to remind myself, first of all, that, that I had a distinct skill to bring, but also that there were a lot of us who were having some of the same challenges in the organizations that we were working in and, uh, and, and having sort of that mind to work together to try different things, to identify new solutions, and then really um, more importantly to create processes that we could then adapt to each setting so that, um, so that we could you know, like the, the referral and some of these things that, that really seem to work in one place uh, that could be adapted and would work in another place. And I think that's how we built our coalition of, of therapists in this area that are doing some really great work and getting recognized for it. So definitely just reach out, try to find uh, other professionals in that same setting and, uh, and, and be very intentional about meeting and supporting each other and um, having those conversations, it was such a great, for me, it was just really pushed me professionally, pushed me to think. Um, it was a really nice collaborative experience uh, that felt really effective. Thank you so much. Those are two wonderful golden nuggets to end our interview on. This has been truly informative. It's been inspirational. Um, thank you again so much for sharing your your knowledge and expertise uh, related to to mental health and, and the 988 initiative. Um, I think our listeners are, are going to be motivated and uh, feel uh, more encouraged and, and enabled to, to take some action steps related to, to these topics that we've talked about. So thank you both so much for your time. Thanks, Matthew. You know, the only thing I didn't say that I wanted to <laughs> is how incredibly um, supportive AOTA has been towards uh, bringing mental health first aid actually in our conferences and I, I think it's Christine, but in our conferences and um, other opportunities that AOTA has offered to first for practitioners to be trained in mental health first aid. So I really appreciate that. Thanks for listening to the AOTA podcast. Tune in again next time.